Hey, good morning, Dr. James W. Wilson, research professor of the Cooperative Education at Northeastern University. What I'd like to chat with you about this morning, Jim, is what I'm choosing to call the oral history of RIT, in which I am interviewing some of the old timers who uh, are still at the Institute or have recently retired or have left for other reasons, such as yourself. And I would just like to raise some questions with you and then chat informally and uh, just to see how this goes. So uh, tell me, Jim, when did you come to RIT? Well, as a matter of fact, it was uh, August 23rd, 1946. Let's just double check on the volume here. Well, you remember the date very well, then, I think. I do. It was, uh, of course, my first professional employment. I had just uh, left the University of Rochester, where I had been working on my master's degree, and uh, we were the Institute had the uh, Advisement Center, the Veter Veterans Advisement Center, located at 150 Spring Street. And that's where I first went to work uh, as a vocational advisor. And you were in the Counseling Center then for quite a while, were you not? Yes. At the end of that year, you may recall, uh, RIT ended its contract with the Veterans Administration. And there were three of us. I recall at that time who were retained in an employee of the Institute. One was Larry Lipsett, uh, and one was Mary Frances Dudley, and the other was, was me. And I was uh, joined uh, Calvin Tomlinson, uh, who was the head of the then Social Science Department, and I was a full time faculty member teaching uh, human relations uh, that following year. That's right, I had forgotten some of that. Well, there were some interesting experiences in the Advisement Center. Uh, we certainly served a tremendous number of veterans there over a relatively short period of time. Yes, I think we averaged uh, something like three and a third veterans uh, per person uh, a day. Some of them were uh, very unusual, very <laughs> yes, interesting. They were. It was a fascinating experience, and uh, uh, it was uh, also my first introduction to what I have come to learn more about in recent years, the, the bureaucracy in the federal government, because we had to relate to the, the federal employees of the advisement uh, or of the Veterans Administration during that time. And the numerous forms and changes in regulations. Well, yes, and uh, the problems of declaring under Public Law 16 for the disabled veteran, the problem of declaring that they indeed were in need of, uh, of training. It took me a long while to discover what plainest 10% was. <laughs> right. <laughs> Very simply, flat feet. Flat feet, right. <laughs> well, tell me then, you uh, you taught uh, human relations or psychology is a more academic term uh, for Calvin Thomason for... One seven, year. One year, was that right. it? Right. And then, you, then I went back into the, the counseling center, which during that previous year had uh, essentially become a, a civilian counseling center based upon the experiences gained with the Veterans Administration. And I went back with you uh, and Larry Lipsett at that time, and uh, I think it was until 1953 that I stayed with you and Larry, and you were at working essentially in, in vocational counseling. Uh, I think we were at that time beginning to uh, one of the things I do recall, we were trying to encourage more institute students to participate in the uh, services of the Counseling Center, and I remember it was interesting that in some of the department heads were a little reluctant to let us get our hands on their students because of the long tradition that they had had as the, as the counselor of students. Uh, the professional upstarts uh, were looked upon with a little bit of suspect, I think. Yes, I think you're entirely correct there. I remember that well. well now, uh, who were some of the key people? You've mentioned Larry Lipset, of course. Uh, who were some of the other key people around the Institute uh, when you uh, first uh, came and then when you moved over to the Social Science Department? Um, well, let's see. Of course, there was Calvin Thomason, who was the head of the department and had a really was a well-known person. I, I don't think I fully appreciated that when I first joined him because he had certain personal idiosyncrasies which were probably better known around the Institute, but 
uh, a very well-respected person in in, uh, in the community, uh, developing these courses uh, in, in uh, human relations and in economics. Really, the the management program, yeah. which uh, developed uh, more in subsequent years, but he was certainly a, a very key person, I think. There was, as a colleague, Frank Clement, who later became the head of that department, and then later, uh, well, I guess it was never a college, well, he was the head, but a division yeah. at that time. Uh, probably there were two very important people, uh, in addition to Mark Ellingson himself, which I, I don't mean to pass over <laughs> lightly, because he was, uh, he was certainly a very important person. But there was yourself, uh, who uh, became increasingly important. I think, to me as an individual and to the development of the Institute over the years, and I think a very strong leadership role. Those are kind words. <laughs> they, they are meant with great sincerity, too. Uh, then there were people such as W.W. Uh, w. Charters, which I think was a, uh, an absolutely fantastic person, and Ralph Tyler. I think perhaps one of the unique features of the Institute was that it did keep on a regular retainer basis uh, two outstanding educators in the country as consultants. And I think they were quite influential in the uh, development of the Institute. And then some of the other people that I recall, of course, was uh, Edwin Hogadone. Yes, he was uh, great. Deeply fond of. And uh, really was a very strong person, uh, probably in my judgment one of the most effective deans that we ever had at the Institute. And uh, I recall first uh, Ralph and Pearson as the head of the, first the head of the chemistry department and then later the dean of that uh, college. First Harold Brennan was probably the, well, I don't know how I would describe Harold. But he was certainly a very effective person in, well, maybe he was kind of the conscience of the Institute in, yes, in a way. I mean, he had a way of, of putting forth the goals of the Institute in very humanistic terms, I think. Educational statesman. Right. I yeah. Get, yeah, that would be a good way of expressing it. I think these were all very important people. The chap that I always enjoyed and I felt made great contributions was Al John. <clears throat> right. Uh, now, I, of course, I came, well, no, he was there quite a while while I was there, and I never felt that I got to know Al as well as I might have, and yet he had a a sense of history about him that uh, I, I could always remember when some discussion would come up in uh, various group meetings and he would kind of remind us that probably this had been discussed before, you know, don't get too carried away with what you, uh, you know, that you've discovered truth or something of this sort. Yeah, yeah. Very, very fine person. The thing I enjoyed about Al is he could uh, outquote the Veterans Administration on their own regulation. Right, he knew them well, and, uh, and he's also a person I remember that uh, had he been around at the time of uh, Alexander Graham Bell, they would never have bothered to invent the telephone. <laughs> he, he had a voice that pierced anything. <laughs> Carried, that's for sure. Well, then, uh, as I remember, we had quite a bit to do with the. Uh, you had quite a bit to do with the Middle States accrediting, the first, uh, first go around, the Institute came up for the accreditation process. Yeah, that was a, I would say that was probably the point at which I felt I, I was coming into uh, maturity at the Institute. That, um, we got involved in that. that. By that time, I, of course, the Counseling Center had split off from the Dean of Instruction and the Educational Research Activities, and I had gone with you. This was in 1953, and it was during that period that we began to move on from uh, granting the associate degree to the baccalaureate degree, and then we, well, obviously we had to meet with uh, Middle States people, and Taylor Jones came, and I remember that uh, I was asked to be the chairman of our self-study group, and we uh, conducted a, essentially a two-year study, and I thought it was a very honest effort on our part to uh, come to know the Institute better and to document it. I remember feeling that we were took to heart so sincerely this notion of we should try to find out what we are as an institution, that we 
until almost the tail end for almost totally ignored the questions that Middle State specifically asked upon which we had to base our report and then we uh, well I, I describe it to people even now as the time came he locked me into a little room which was off the old gymnasium in the Eastman Annex uh, with a uh, dictaphone and uh, some scissors and paste and uh, there I was until we got those reports the done. Reports out, huh? It was, a, it was really, a, I think, a very uh, important period in the Institute's life because it, it meant kind of the backing away from the, the older notion that we had and the almost disdain from any, well, degree-granting activities and uh, influence by the state. We could just sort of turn our back on them and that we now were changing our position and joining their ballpark. And, uh, this was an important shift, I think. Well, that's correct. You were there during some of the most interesting years, certainly, uh, because at the time you came, uh, just after World War II, if a person even mentioned an associate degree, the possibility of RIT granting an associate degree, his mouth probably would have been washed out with soap. <laughs> right. We were a, a shirt sleeve greaseball institution. That's right. And, uh, and there was a... I've wondered since, Leo, as a matter of fact, whether we were doing the right thing, you know, now that it was yes. it's all in retrospect. At the time, of course, it seemed very right, and we there were pressures on us, of course, to move in this direction. I'm not sure we could have stopped it if we tried, and I certainly felt it was important that we move ahead. But there was a kind of character to the institute in terms of its focus and its, uh, its really its mission as an institution. It served a community very, very well, and. Uh, I think there there was a period, of course, I suppose any transition, you can't go from one direction to another without some period of floundering. I think toward the latter years that I was there, I, I have a feeling that there was a sort of losing of its mm -hmm. mission and not quite having evolved a new one and feeling that there was a period of floundering there. Well, I think that's undoubtedly true. I feel, of course, that really we had to change with the coming uh, New York State or State University of New York and the system of community colleges that were being established, mm -hmm. which, were, which were in direct competition. competition. Surely, I agree with you. But uh, it was an interesting period of change. Oh, it was an exciting period. I, I think that, uh, you know, during the, well, almost the last 10 years, the uh, discussions of whether or not we should stay in the third ward or whether we should move and if we move where we should move and the kind of move and there was always a sense of excitement I remember we always are saying you know when we get over this then there'll be a period of stability well there never was a sense of stability all the while I was there we were always moving from one thing to another we uh, during the period that I was there we uh, added the uh, McKechnie Lunger School of Commerce which became our, our business college. Uh, the School for American Craftsmen was added. Uh, I guess those, well, then we certainly developed the uh, Technical Institute for the Deaf began toward the latter few years. And the College of Science was formed. Uh, the the right. Department of the, the uh, base. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, Jim, you were, you were uh, relieved sometime along during this period to make a study of cooperative education. Right. It was in uh, 1958. Was that the year? I yep. was a year and a half. Sorry. Yeah, it was a year and a half uh, leave of absence. Tell us a little bit about the, the study, briefly, and then about the effectiveness of the co-op system. Okay. That you've been so much interested in all of your professional career, at least the last several decades. The last several years. Well, it was in 1958, um, they had held a, a conference sponsored by the, the Kettering Foundation. Uh, actually, it was in 1956 that this conference was held in Dayton, Ohio, and they were looking at that time of the what they called the impending crisis of the flood of students that were anticipated, and co-op education was looked at as one possible means of dealing with the anticipated flood of students because when organized uh, in certain ways you can accommodate many more students on a given campus with the current facilities. 
So then, as a result of that conference, people said, well, you know, really, if you're going to promulgate this notion, uh, somebody ought to do a, uh, an appraisal of the effectiveness of it from the standpoint of, of the education of the students. So a group of people, uh, of which Ta Ralph Tyler was asked to be the chairman, secured a grant from the Fund for the Advancement of Education in the amount of $95,000 to conduct uh, an 18-month uh, national evaluation of co-op. And uh, Ralph Tyler asked me if I would be the uh, director of the study, and I did. It was uh, a very exciting kind of activity to, to be involved in. And basically what we did, uh, you may recall, we uh, rented space from the Institute. We had taken over the old Graflex uh, gatehouse or employment uh, house at that time down on Clarissa Street on the corner of Clarissa and Broad. And from there we operated for the next year and a half and uh, obtained uh, the cooperation of a good many institutions throughout the country, uh, a sample which had co-op had had it for a number of years in a sample which did not have co-op. And we collected a wide variety of kinds of data from students at both these samples of institutions and from alumni. Uh, I think altogether something like 26 institutions were involved in the study. And we uh, concluded as a result of the, the kinds of data we had and that uh, co-op education indeed has merit for the student. Does provide a, a well traditionally as it was operated for many years. It, its greatest known values were in terms of career direction, providing uh, real information about the world of work, providing job contacts in the future, and various things of that sort. But also led the way to suggest that there were other kinds of uh, educational benefits in terms of the providing students with a greater sense of confidence in his own abilities, uh, a kind of maturing. And more recently, I've talked about it in terms of the student has spent many years learning the role of what it is to be a student, but he has not had much practice in what it is to be an adult worker, and this gives him an opportunity. Uh, though I don't think that I may express it that way, the idea isn't any really greatly new. Uh, I keep coming back to the way that uh, Boss Kett, uh, Charles Kettering used to talk about it, when he would relate it to uh, welding. Say, uh, a traditional education is like a butt weld, in which the only point of contact between the two pieces of weld of education and adulthood come at the point of graduation. But then a uh, cooperative education is like a lap weld, where there are several points of contact of, of learning and, and adult work. And then he would always add that any damn fool knows that a lap weld is stronger than a butt weld. Well, I think that kind of sums up what co-op education is about. Very good. Well, out of this came a book, as I remember, that you uh, authored, or at least were the senior author. Right. Uh, it was called Works, College Work Study Programs, and it was a really the report of research here. It was the, uh, presented all the data of the study. Uh, it was written with my assistant on the study, uh, and Ed Lyons, who was at that time a coordinator at the University of Detroit, has since left education and co-op and is in, uh, uh, I'm not even sure what kind of business he's in, but he lives in Detroit, I know that. Um, it was an unusual kind of thing in the sense that uh, it was picked up and used as a takeoff point not only for an immediate conference, which a working conference to try to interest people in the uh, formation of co-op programs on college campuses, but it was also the basis for the uh, founding of the National Commission for Cooperative Education, which became a, and still exists, became a uh, special educational agency really to, well, at the outset, its five-year goal was to double the number of colleges uh, offering co-op programs, which at that time, this would be now about 1961, there were about 65 institutions with co-op, and they had hoped to double that within a five-year period, and they, they more than did that by 1966. We had uh, probably 150 or 
150 to 170 institutions. How many institutions are there now? Do you have any idea? Oh, we have an idea, but it's in a bullish market. It's hard to keep up with it. But as far as we can tell, there are about 350 programs today with probably another 100 institutions in various stages of planning or uh, feasibility study yeah. of the ideas. Of course, it also rapidly. depends on it, just how strictly you define cooperative education. Right. Uh, if you're an engineer, uh, it may, it may, it may, it's going to be fewer than that. But if you think of it as I do, which is uh, the basic defining character of a cooperative education program is the inclusion of productive work on the part of students as an integral part of the curriculum, then we come up with this figure. If you begin to restrict it and say that it must be on an alternating pattern or that it must be employment uh, or compensated work or that it uh, must be work which is strictly related to the student's major field of study, then yes, we, we, mm -hmm. there are many fewer programs, but I, I think those are ways in which a, a concept can be implemented, and the concept is that of making work part of the curriculum that the student relates to the world about him. Well, of course, then it was largely as a result of this, uh, the reputation you gained because of that study and the outstanding job that Northeastern had uh, done. In fact, they were also given a grant, as I remember, to, yes. to establish a, a research uh, professorship. Right. Uh, that you were offered this uh, position. This position. Yeah, the Northeastern... Well, when the National Commission was founded, uh, the uh, new president of Northeastern University at that time, Asa Knowles, was invited to be a trustee, and he attended the first meeting and became quite excited about the possibilities here, and he volunteered his head of cooperative education, Roy Woldridge, to work half-time uh, with the commission. And uh, so for a number of years, that's precisely what he did, that uh, they just donated half his time. And uh, as the commission grew, the reputation of Northeastern as a co-op institution simultaneously grew. And in 1960 six or 65, I don't recall which, Northeastern was given a grant from the Ford Foundation because the Ford Foundation was planning to uh, make a number of direct grants to colleges to start co-op, and they wanted some place to provide consulting services, and so they went and turned to Northeastern and Roy Woldridge and said, you, uh, you know, we, this is your primary duty, but any other consulting or activities that you want to carry on in this regard, uh, go ahead. And so with that, they really founded the Center for Cooperative Education in Northeastern, in which they brought in another chap who was a coordinator who became a training director. They started providing uh, workshops at various sources. And then in 1967, they went back to the Ford Foundation and said, one of our concerns is that there is nobody in a with an academic orientation, really working at co-op, thinking about a, a philosophic base for this program. We're, we're all operational, and we think it would be a good thing for the development of co-op if we had something of this sort. And they proposed a, uh, a professorship. Now, it was interesting to me, after I went there, I was invited to, to fill that chair, but I knew it was after they had gone to Ralph Tyler, and Ralph Tyler, Call by that time was about ready to retire and turned it down. So I was flattered that I was the next one on the list, but I was even more flattered when I read their proposal after I went there because it said in the proposal to Ford Foundation to ask for this sum of money, which was $375,000, to bring to the campus uh, persons such as Ralph W. Tyler or James W. Wilson, <laughs> and who have been included right in that, I felt. Uh, flying in pretty good company, so I was quite flattered and, and honored to do it. And the specific terms of the grant were they would give $375,000 and the university would match it to make a $750,000 endowment, which is what I now have. Well, when was it you joined Northeastern? Uh, it was in August. I, I moved in August, in yeah. August of 1968, so that I had actually been at the Institute just 22 years at the time I, I moved, and 
I, of course, you may recall, I, I had a variety of jobs in that I started out in the advisement center, then taught for a year, went back to the counseling center, then went into educational research. Then when I came back from that study on co-op, I became the dean of the then College of General Studies and was there for seven years, then went back into research and then left in 68. Well, it was a great loss to RIT when you left, but I'm sure it was a great gain for Northeastern. Well, <laughs> I, I appreciate those kind of words, sir. <laughs> Well, we still have a few uh, minutes on this side of the tape. Uh, Jim, as you uh, viewed the co-op program at RIT, what would you say are some of the strengths and also some of the weaknesses of the program at RIT? Well, it's hard to just jump on that and say the strengths and the weakness. I think, first of all, uh, that it is a, a strength of the it is a, a uh, the concept of a co-op education in an institution, particularly of the, the kind of direction which North, uh, RIT has traditionally had, that it is a, a kind of natural thing. I suppose my disappointment was that it never pushed it further. Mm -hmm. um, it has maintained, it has perhaps one of the, the strangest administrative directions of any institution I know in co-op in that it's as though it had two co-op programs, one in the College of Business, uh, which is uh, centralized within that college, and then one that applies to the College of uh, Engineering now and, and the College of Science, which is really run through the, uh, the placement office. And uh, I would say that there is there is both strength and weakness in that. Um, the strength, I think, is that is that within the College of Business, it is clearly and unequivocally considered a part of the educational program, uh, with uh, Dr. Travis as the uh, as a member of the of the college, and so far as I know, still teaches a course or so. He is a clearly an accepted member of the faculty and the. the any issues re revolving around co-op are solved and dealt with within an educational context. I think that is not the case, or so likely the case, or with the College of Engineering, College of Science, where it is in the placement office, where it is more likely to be thought of as a placement activity, and that the students are, uh, it's a cheaper way for a kid to go through college. In fact, I quote one of the former heads of that division before it became a college. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if one were to follow the, the way that many institutions do, which is to centralize it all under what one, one head, there is an advantage there in that it becomes develops a life of its own and it can proselytize for other departments to get involved in co-op, which is a little more difficult if you are contained strictly with, say, within business. Um, that is, Dr. Travis's activities are confined to what goes on in the College of Business, and he's less likely to get over into the College of, uh, uh, well, Art and Design, for example. The disadvantage, I think, of a centralized program, which is what our Eastern is that you then have to develop mechanisms which will relate the co-op co staff to the teaching faculty, and there are frictions that can develop there. Uh, but I think that North, uh, that RIT, and I apologize for the confusion <laughs> here, I was so long, I do this all the time, uh, uh, that within the uh, College of Business, I think it has a, a very, potentially, a very idealistic setup close relationship. I think probably in the College of uh, Science and Engineering that my judgment would be that it is probably you don't you you have neither uh, a group which can carry on uh, academically the idea of co-op nor do you relate as well to the faculty and I suspect that the faculty there hardly know that co-op goes on. 
which uh, the teaching faculties, except that students leave periodically and return periodically. <coughs> Those would be the, you know, the main criticisms. Yeah. I think that, uh, quite honestly, I am disappointed from time to time when I am in various meetings with people who are talking about uh, co-op institutions and talk about the important co-op programs in the country, and seldom does our IT get mentioned. And yet, and in fact, many people are sometimes surprised mm -hmm. to hear that our IT has it. And then when I say, well, it's had it since 1900. Well, I'd say the the greatest satisfactions were, I suppose, two kinds. Uh, those that related to my personal development as a uh, professional educator and as a, I hope, a human being, and those which related more to the, the work at the Institute directly. Take the personal ones first, and I, you know, the fact that I was able to really, with the, the help of the Institute, obtain my doctorate at the University of Chicago under Ralph Tyler. You know, this was before all the formal arrangements were developed for faculty members being able to uh, have tuition remission or tuition paid for at other institutions and all the formalized work that we went through. Or I remember it was, in, it was after my year of teaching uh, in the social science department that Mark Ellingson was still giving all the contracts to faculty himself and uh, calling us down to his office and he called me down and said, Jim, your employment at RIT is not contingent upon this, but if you'd like to start working on your doctorate at the University of Chicago, we'll help you. And uh, I think that opportunity to uh, go to Chicago and study under Ralph in a kind of uh, homemade co-op program where I would commute between Rochester and Chicago over a number of years, was, and to get the degree was a matter of great personal satisfaction. I think the uh, opportunity to to meet I, I and work with some very fine people was a matter of great personal satisfaction. In terms of accomplishments uh, at RIT, I, I would have to confess that I I was really quite proud of the work that we did on the um, that middle stage study in 1958 and the, the results of that uh, activity and. The fact that as a result of our becoming a member of Middle State, you and I were then invited to be members of visiting teams, which uh, I enjoyed. That was very satisfying. I think when I became the, uh, the Dean of the College of General Studies after that co-op study, uh, uh, there were elements of, of satisfaction there because I think the what had been a, a department which had done well but I think suffered from a terrible inferiority complex within the context of a technological yeah. institution to be the, the social scientists and the humanists uh, and many members of the faculty felt a little bit insecure and I think that perhaps over a period of a number of years that they began to feel a little bit more relaxed uh, about this sort of thing. Well, I think the work that you carried on there and developing the curriculum in the, the College of General Studies was outstanding, Jim. I think that contributed a great deal to the faculty's feeling of security. Well, I, I'd like to think so, and I, I remember there was a very interesting period of time and in that I think by that time I, I had listened to you long enough about uh, you know, take it easy. I, I can remember now being a brash young fellow, as many young fellows probably are, and that uh, it was working with you that uh, made it a lot easier. Note, due to some mishap, we lost about the last 10 minutes of the interview with Dr. Wilson. Therefore, whoever is listening to this or whoever may be transcribing it, please close it this way. Follows. Well, Jim, it looks as though our time is about up. I sincerely appreciate your being willing to stop by here during the Christmas holidays and record this.
and once again want to express my great appreciation for the numerous contributions you made to RIT during the years that you were there. That is all. <laughs>